In this video, we're going to talk about neurons, specifically the excitation of neurons and the release of neurotransmitters. Neurons become excited, otherwise undergo a change in electrical activity, such as a depolarization event for one purpose, and that is to release neurotransmitters from their axon terminals. A huge part in the nervous system, they are the main excitable cell of the nervous system. They are not the most common cell of the nervous system. Those would be all the support cells of neurons. But neurons are really the hallmark of activity of the nervous system. They allow for thought, emotions, decision-making, modification of heart rate, breathing, any movements we make with our skeletal muscle, all a result of the activity of neurons. So we're gonna take a look at how those neurotransmitters actually get released. Can result in a whole host of downstream activities. Let's just say walking down the street, you smell a perfume that reminds you of your grandmother and gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. And all those events, the smell, the memory, the fuzzy feeling, are the result of the release of neurotransmitters activating different parts of the brain. So let's take a look at how all this happens. The release of neurotransmitters is the result of exocytosis. In a previous video, we talked in detail about exocytosis, but as we can see right here, these are synaptic vesicles in the axon terminals, which contain the neurotransmitters. So just quick review, down here, are the dendrites on the left side. Then we have the cell body, otherwise known as the soma. The axon, this horizontal elongated structure. And then we have the axon terminals. And those axon terminals contain the neurotransmitters. That's where the neurotransmitters are being stored until they are stimulated to be released. The release of neurotransmitters is the result of exocytosis, where the membrane of this synaptic vesicle fuses with the membrane of the axon terminals or the membrane of the neuron to release those neurotransmitters into a region known as the synaptic cleft where it's going to be stimulating a muscle cell, a heart cell, or even another neuron. And we'll talk about those downstream cells in another video. So as we had discussed in our previous video on exocytosis, most exocytosis is the result of the influx of calcium into cells. And keep in mind, this neuron, even though it looks very different than most cells I draw, is a cell. It's a nerve cell. And exocytosis in neurons is the result of calcium influx. What we see right here, and I need to stop actually and tell you, I am working backwards. And then I'm going to go through this forward. When I say backwards, I'm moving from right to left from the axon terminals, and I'm gonna end at the dendrites. But in reality, it all starts at the dendrites through the cell body, down the axon to the axon terminals. I tend to work backwards because I think it's easier to really comprehend what's going on. If for no other reason, we've talked about a lot of this stuff that I'm going to be referring to in reverse. That is to say, we've talked about exocytosis, We've talked about calcium influx causing exocytosis. So please bear in mind with me and understand I am working backwards at this moment, but we will fast forward towards the end of this lecture. This is a protein, it's a protein channel, specifically a voltage gated calcium channel. Now I don't have a gate drawn in here, but please understand that for calcium to move into this neuron, the gate must be open. And because it is a voltage sensitive protein, it opens when there is a change in voltage or a depolarization of vent. So calcium influx through this voltage gated channel is going to induce exocytosis of the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. In this next slide here in black, we see a bunch of voltage gated sodium ion channels running the length of the V-axon. And those are utilized to propagate the impulse or the depolarization event from left to right. So we can get the impulse, otherwise known as the depolarization event, from this region right here, which is known as the axon hillock, 
to this voltage sensitive calcium channel. So once again, the only way for this calcium channel to open is if there's a change in voltage, specifically a depolarization event. But we have to get that depolarization event to travel all the way down this axon. That's achieved by these voltage sensitive or voltage gated sodium channels. So once this sodium channel here allows sodium in, it's gonna depolarize this neuron right here to a sufficient level that's going to open up this voltage gated calcium channel. This channel right here is voltage sensitive as well. And that's only gonna open when there's a change in voltage. And that's the result of sodium coming in this protein chain, which is a result of a change in voltage here. So if we look at this, if this first protein right here, this first channel protein allows for sodium to come in, it's gonna depolarize the cell, which is gonna open up this voltage gated sodium channel, depolarizing the neuron, this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, all the way down to the terminal end of this axon. This is like a row of dominoes. If this first voltage-gated sodium channel opens up, we can guarantee the all the subsequent voltage-gated sodium channels are gonna sequentially open. So I said like a row of dominoes. If this first domino falls, and we've set those dominoes up correctly, we can guarantee that last dom domino is gonna fall. And it's the same way with all of these voltage-gated sodium channels along the axon. So these voltage-gated sodium channels allow for the propagation or movement or progression of the depolarization event down the axon to eventually stimulate the opening of this voltage-gated calcium channel, which will allow for calcium influx to cause exocytosis of those neurotransmitters. In this next slide, we're gonna talk about what's known as a graded potential. A graded potential is very similar to an action potential, but there's some differences. It's certainly a depolarization event that will be followed by a repolarization event. Huge characteristic of graded potentials, they are variable in strength. Whereas we talked about this action potential down this axon, that's an all or nothing event. It's not variable in strength. There can be graded potentials that occur in this cell body right here that are not strong enough to make it all the way to the axon hillock. And one term I forgot to mention was threshold. There's a value right here at the axon hillock, a voltage that is, that must be achieved to open up this first voltage-gated sodium channel. And that value is generally negative 55 millivolts. That is the voltage that must be achieved. So if we have a graded potential that travels across this cell body and makes it to negative 55 when it reaches here, then it's gonna open up this voltage-gated sodium channel. But if our initial stimulus is not strong enough, it's gonna peter out and not make it to negative 55. Let's say it's negative 60 millivolts by the time it gets to the axon hillock, that will not open up this first voltage gated sodium channel. So this graded potential, the best way to describe it are ripples in a pond. If you throw a rock or a pebble in a pond or a lake, there's concentric ripples that emanate out from where you initially threw that rock. And those ripples start spreading out and getting weaker the further away from that initial splash that occurred from that rock falling into the water. As a result, we have these ripples or the transmission of this impulse that's weakening as it's crossing. It's weakening as it's crossing until it gets to the axon hilla. That's why we need a strong enough stimulus to cause this first domino to fall. So graded potentials are variable in strength, and that's a key characteristic of graded potentials. Okay, so how do we get that initial depolarization or graded potential in the cell body? That's the role of the dendrites, specifically the ion channels within the dendrites. And what I've drawn here in blue 
are ligand gated ion channels. Truthfully, on each dendrite, there's probably going to be hundreds. On each dendrite, there may even be some of these ion channels directly on the plasma membrane of the cell body. But these ligand gated ion channels, when they open, will allow for the influx of sodium to come in and depolarize the cell body and hopefully make it to threshold at the axon hillock where that first domino or first voltage gated sodium channel is located. Now, these don't always have to be ligand gated. They could be mechanically gated. I believe I've even read they could be voltage gated, but I have a hard time grasping my head around how they could be voltage gated. So these are ligand gated ion channels. So there's a number of different ligands in the body that could activate a neuron. Once the ligand binds to these channels, the channels open, allow for the influx of sodium, causing a greater potential along the cell body, which activates this first voltage gated sodium channel. If it reach, reaches threshold at negative 55, all of these subsequent voltage gated sodium channels are going to open like or fall like a row of dominoes to cause this region of the neuron to depolarize to a specific voltage to open up this voltage gated calcium channel. We get the influx of calcium into the neuron that causes calcium induced exocytosis and then we get the release of neurons. There's a number of things I've left out of this, like cytoplasmic resistance, current leak, which we'll talk about in a subsequent video. But that's the essence of the release of neurotransmitters from a neuron.